Hello and welcome to my review of Ghost Brigades by John Scalzi. Now I have to start with a small confession. I found this book in the book club at work and, and it seemed like it had an interesting premise so I started to read it and I had no idea that it was actually a follow-up to Old Man's War, which I haven't read. So when I talk later about some of the issues I have with this book, it may be that some of them would have been explained if I'd read the, the first book. So I am prepared to be called a if that's the case. So the book starts well enough. It's quite atmospheric and vaguely reminiscent of some of Alan Dean Foster's science fiction. There's a man kind of being held against his wishes on a planet that comes under attack. Now the people holding him decide they need to kill him to silence him. And like most of us, he has a desire to carry on living and a little bit of tenacity about him. So he fights them off and eventually comes face to face with the attackers. And it is revealed that he is in fact not human and the attackers are. So... As well as being atmospheric, it was quite a nice little twist, and I felt so far so good. So I'll very quickly have a run through of the plot. Three alien races have combined and are planning to attack humanity. Now a defector by the name of Charles Booten, now I apologise, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but Charles Booten has betrayed humanity, and in the work that he's left behind, the humans have found a, a, a recording of his mind on hard disk. So they decide to clone Bhutan and imprint the, the, the image of his mind into the clone and then find out what he's told the enemy. For one reason or another, the imprint doesn't take and the clone, now called Jared Dirac, is sent to military training under Jane Sagan. Now Sagan, as far as I know, is the only character from Old Man's War to actually feature in this novel in any meaningful way. While Dirac is undergoing military training, he gets involved in a little bit of a love triangle with uh, a girl called Pauling, and an another fellow is involved. His name is Seaborg. About halfway through the novel, Dirac starts to get Bootin's memories. In one scene that I found particularly effective, Dirac gets back the memory of his daughter Zoe, and then remembers that she's been killed. Despite the fact that the military know that Dirac is starting to get some of Bhutan's memories, they still send him on the final mission, which is the one to kill or capture Bhutan. Certainly the logic behind that is questionable, but that isn't the only part of the novel that leaves you scratching your head trying to make sense of the thought processes of the characters involved. For example, the military are losing special forces ships. These ships are disappearing without any communication for the most part. But to the reader, it's fairly obvious how it's being done and who is doing it. And yet the military make no actions in an attempt to, to stop it, including sending special forces troops that are clearly compromised on the final mission. One of the missions they send Dirac on is an attempt to persuade one of the enemy factions to leave the triumvirate that is threatening humanity. Basically, the special forces attack the, the palace of the leader of the planet, they kill her husband, and they kidnap her baby. So initially it's clear they have leverage, they can force the alien queen to pull out of the pact that's threatening humanity. But then they sterilise the baby, and then shortly after that, they kill the baby. Which seems to me that they've now lost any leverage that they had, and in far from pacifying the enemy, they have in fact just antagonised it. The way it's kind of explained in the novel is that by killing the husband, they will force the queen to take another husband that's more sympathetic to the human cause. And which of course is all well and good. You can certainly see how they would do that with leverage, but they don't have any if they've killed the baby. And I think that the way that the book kind of explains it is that by killing the baby, they save the queen from the embarrassment of having had her baby sterilized by her enemy, the embarrassment of which would have seen her lose face to the factions that support her, and then she might have lost her position of authority. Now, if you're listening to that thinking, oh, this sounds like political intrigue, perhaps in the way of Daughter of the Empire, or perhaps even Game of Thrones, um, you'd be wrong. This happens on pretty much a single page of explanation. And that's true of a lot of the issues that Scalzi tries to put into the book. Most of them seem to be there only to be mentioned and then never brought up again. Another thing is that how much of this book seems to be borrowed from other work, and often better work as well. For a little while there are parallels drawn between the creation of these clones and the Frankenstein story, but after perhaps five pages of, of knocking the idea around, it's never brought up again. We've seen aspects of the military training before in numerous other media as well. For example, Full Metal Jacket, um, Officer and a Gentleman, 
um, but also in the science fiction world with um, Starship Troopers and Ender's Game, both of which are name-checked in Scalzi's text. Perhaps like all good academics, Scalzi simply quoting his sources, but his work never comes up to the same level of quality. For example, while in The Ghost Brigade, Scalzi openly refers to Starship Troopers the movie as dumb, the love triangle in, in, the, in that film, while not particularly effective, is still better than the one that he develops between Dirac, Seaborg and Pauling. Theirs is, is rather anemic. Pauling and, and Dirac have a relationship. Seaborg's a little antagonistic towards it. And then, as in Starship Troopers, the, the female member of the Triangle is killed in combat. But in this one, Dirac and Seaborg are just then friends, and, and it's never really mentioned again. On one of the military exercises, Dirac and Seaborg decide to climb into the tree so that they can attack their enemy from above. And straight away I was thinking of the line from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, about two-dimensional thinking. And it seems that by this point, everything in the book has been borrowed from somewhere else. During the final mission, the attempt to kill or capture Bootin, Sagan comes across Zoe, who is Bootin's daughter that we were led to believe was dead. And immediately I was thinking of Ripley and Newt. But Sagan and Zoe begin their relationship at page 300 out of 340, whereas Ripley and Newt had the majority of a movie to turn their relationship into something meaningful. At the end of the book, when their mission is over, Sagan's reward is to be allowed to retire early. And uh, with John Perry from Old Man's War, who, who's not in this book, he's just name-checked. And they're allowed, basically, to take Zoe as their daughter. As we've been told throughout the novel, the colonies that people are sent to retire on, and that Sagan, Zoe, and Perry will be living on, change hands fairly often between the, the races in the galaxy, nearly always violently, and often with no survivors. So it seems like it's not much of a reward for Sagan or Perry, particularly having invested two books in the characters to this point. There are other issues with the novel as well. It feels highly episodic, and really a lot of the actions lack any sort of meaningful consequences or have any bearing on the plot going forward. For example, during the development of Pauling and Dirac's relationship, there's an orgy that takes place in the training camp, and they both sleep with other people during it, and, and yet at no point is any part of that ever mentioned again in the book. Dirac doesn't begin to get Putin's memories until page 170 out of 340 something, and I can't help but think that if that had happened earlier and developed alongside some of the other action, it would have helped the flow of the novel and made it feel slightly less episodic. The book may even have developed into a little more of a character study of Dirac, which is what I was kind of expecting from the back cover. Whereas it's actually about page 300 out of 340 before Dirac is faced with any meaningful questions about his creation and where his life is leading. The action sequences that are praised in the Washington Post as blood roiling. Um, well, perhaps blood roiling has a different meaning to what I thought it did. It is an American word after all, and I am an Englishman, but I found them to be rather dull because basically all that happens here is Dirac and the other squad mates are just mowing down nameless, faceless people. And that leaves Scalzi with a little bit of a problem in that his action sequences read along the lines of Dirac did this, the Enishan did this, and it all becomes a little bit repetitive and dull. You compare the tension of, of from, from Star Wars, you know, Luke and Darth Vader facing off with, with Dirac killing people that we've no exposure to whatsoever before their death. Unfortunately, as a result of Scalzi's writing style or ability or even lack thereof, there's no tension, no excitement. Initially, we're led to believe that Putin's motivation for, for wanting the war between humanity and his other three races uh, is the loss of his daughter Zoe. But when we discover that Zoe is in fact alive, his motivation actually turns out to be that the CDF is evil and is preventing humanity from opening more useful relations across the galaxy. Now, if that was supposed to draw parallels with our current situations and relationships between different nations, then it really isn't developed in any meaningful way, just like in other parts of the book. It's just there for a page to pay lip service to, to fill space before we move on to the next thing. Either way, his motivation for wanting the war feels unsatisfactory to a reader, as does, in fact, the Obin's reasons for agreeing to it. 
This is a, a race, more or less, of drones that suddenly decide that they want a more individual consciousness, something that they have been created to neither have nor desire. And if Putin did succeed in destroying the CDF as he wanted, or at least removing his military capability, he would be exposing half of the human worlds in the galaxy to outright slaughter. So who would I recommend this book to? Well, other than people who are already fans of Scalzi's work, who, who may or may not like this, I could only recommend this to you if it was your stated intent to read every science fiction novel ever written, good or bad. It borrows from all of these other sources and tries to create an original framework around it, but it never successfully stands on its own two feet. Well, thank you for listening to my review of Ghost Brigades by John Scalzi. Feel free to click like, dislike, comment, slander, as your uh, opinion dictates. This is only mine after all. If you enjoyed this review, even if you agreed or disagreed with it, there are plenty more on my channel, so feel free to check them out as well. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.